Rags to riches is a theme we like to dream about, but how many of us can actually get there? Hi everyone, Ken here. Welcome to This House. Today we are exploring Linwood Hall, the home of a man who succeeded with the American dream. Make sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House. In 1834, Peter Widener was born into an average working class family. His father, Johannes, was a brickmaker and his mother Sarah tended to the needs of their modest household. By the time he reached adulthood, Peter was by all means just an average man living in Philadelphia. In 1858, he married the love of his life, Hannah, and the couple would have three sons together. They were a close, working-class family, just like the one Peter had grown up in. He made an honest living as a butcher's assistant, packing meat and serving customers every day. But that would all change at the dawn of the American Civil War. Hearing the murmuring from his customers about the logistics of war, an idea popped into his head. He applied for a government contract to supply the Union Army with meat, and much to his own surprise, the government accepted his contract and funded him with a $50,000 grant, or the modern-day equivalent of about $1.7 million in cash. This was more than enough to supply troops with food, so he took his profits and invested in the Philadelphia Traction Company as a founding partner. Building transit systems between major cities made him incredibly wealthy, so much so that he became a principal partner in not only the American Tobacco Company, but also in U.S. Steel. With this money, he became a major stakeholder in Standard Oil and secured himself as one of the world's wealthiest men, with a net worth of about $100 million, or the modern-day equivalent of about $3.2 billion. With his wealth, he purchased a vacation house in the 1880s, known as Linwood Hall, a high Queen Anne-style house that had originally been built in 1860. The family would enjoy only a few summers here before Hannah died unexpectedly in 1896 while sailing on the family yacht. Peter was a family man, and the death of his beloved wife and best friend was very hard for him. He devised a plan to bring his family back together, under one roof, and he had the means to do it. He demolished Linwood Hall and hired architect Horace Trumbauer to design a new Linwood Hall in its place. The mansion would be designed in the Palladian style, with a footprint of 325 feet by 215 feet. The 110-room mansion boasted over 69,000 square feet with 55 bedrooms, enough to house Peter's entire family along with several guests. Dominating the Indiana limestone facade was a portico composed of six limestone columns supporting a triangular pediment. The entablature and round window would be added later in 1910. Behind the portico, the facade allowed for 17 window bays to be placed symmetrically, spanning the width of the house until terminating in rounded pavilions, adjoined to either side. Surrounding the entire home was a terrace set at a half-story above the ground level. You would enter the home through the center of the portico, between bronze double doors before arriving at a secondary set of gold leaf doors, which welcomed you into the two-story entrance hall. The checkered black and white marble floors sat below Persian rugs. Pilasters, framing archways, led the eye up to the stained glass ceiling, which allowed for a spectacular array of colors to flood into the marble hall. The main floor of the home boasted many lavish rooms, including a ballroom, which could accommodate 1,000 guests. The walnut wall panels were accented by gold leaf pilasters, above which was a ceiling mural contained in an oval frame, with four crystal chandeliers suspended from it. The dining room was decorated with murals on the walls, and a single Persian rug to cover the floors. The solid marble fireplace was set against walnut panels and centered below a cartouche. Pilasters were covered in gold leaf, leading the eye towards the decorative frieze set below a coffered ceiling with laurel accents. Later on in the mansion's life, the walnut walls would be replaced with white and green marble. The drawing room was fashioned in the Louis XIV style. In designing the home, Incorporating Peter's vast art collection was of utmost importance. The entirety of the North Wing's second floor was devoted to gallery space. Here you could see works of art by artists including Raphael, Rembrandt, Manet, Renoir, and Degas. Peter's favorite artist was Van Dyck, so it was only fitting that he had a room entirely dedicated to him, known as the Van Dyck Room. Here, he not only kept art by Van Dyck, but also housed the Statue of David by Donatello in the center of the room. Above the fireplace 
hung a painting titled The Meatpacker, painted by John Singer Sargent to serve as a reminder to Peter of his humble beginnings. Among its many great rooms were also spaces for the family, with each of Peter's sons having their own private apartments inside the house which they each lived in with their own respective families. In 1912, Peter's son George and his grandson Harry met their fate aboard the Titanic just before George's daughter, Peter's granddaughter, Eleanor, was to be married on the property. Soon after, in 1915, Peter passed away and left the house along with $60 million to his son Joseph. Joseph carried on the tradition of keeping family close by gifting the adjoining estate of Ogantz to his niece Eleanor, who you can learn more about in our previous video. Joseph continued to curate his father's art collection, though his true passion was for landscape design. He had 36 acres immediately surrounding the home, transformed into French gardens with marble balustrade and bronze fountains. He greatly increased and built upon the aesthetic vision of his father. He opened the house to the public for 25 years to allow anyone to come in and enjoy the art galleries by appointment. By 1939, Joseph was growing old and relinquished control of the estate to his nephew, Eleanor's son, George Widener Jr. Joseph spent his last few years ensuring that his father's art collection would be properly cared for. He donated 2,000 paintings and sculptures to the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. Having secured the fate of the art, he passed away in 1943. His heirs were quick to sell off the remaining art, antiques, and furniture at several auctions. The mansion was too large and costly to maintain, so his heirs began selling off the hundreds of acres that surrounded it. The mansion stood abandoned until it was purchased by a developer in 1948 for only $130,000, or the modern-day equivalent of about $1.5 million. The developer was unable to flip the mansion as he had intended, so he sold it to Dr. Carl McIntyre in 1952. The infamous preacher stripped Linwood Hall of its finest materials to fund his controversial church's mission. After losing nonprofit status, McIntyre was not able to afford the mansion, so it was foreclosed on in 2006. It was then purchased by another wealthy pastor, though the house continues to sit empty, continuing to decay. Currently, the fate of Linwood Hall has yet to be determined. Though it is eligible for historic status, it has not been given any protections. Numerous attempts have been made by the current owner to sell it, but no buyers have been found in nearly five years since it hit the market. What do you think will happen to Linwood Hall? Will it suffer the same fate as so many of the other grand mansions? Or will it continue to persist into the hands of the next generation? Let me know your thoughts below. While you're there, make sure to hit the subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House. I would also like to take a moment to say a special thank you to our This House supporters whose names you can see on screen right now. If you would like to see your name on this screen, please consider joining our membership program today. I'll see you next time on This House.